Everybody is a cage that keeps me from dancing with the one I love, but my mind holds the key. I'm living in an age that keeps me from dancing with the one I love, and my mind holds the key. My body is a cage that keeps me from dealing with the one I love, and the mind holds the key. Welcome to my chat room. Let us chat. Chat's democratic. Oh man, somebody writes a. Oh shit, that would be a great name for a book about like the 21st century internet left. Chat's democratic. If anybody knows, uh, that would. Oh, it would be a delicious pun on a, a seminal work on uh, early American working class politics by Sean Willens called Chat's Democratic. So you could call it Chats Democratic, and it would be about, like, you know, the online left. I'd probably be in there, which would be very, very sad, because the local Focos actually got something done. So we'll be talking about the second half of the China boom uh, by Ha Fen Wang, I believe, fuck. Uh, but first, I just got to say something about people freaking out. But not freaking out, really, having this, like, erotic expira expiration around Twitter ending. And it's fascinating to watch. Like, last night, all the news came out. Oh, you know, the uh, Elon fired everybody, and they're locked out of the building, and that means this is it. And so everybody's posting, like, otter to know you gentlemen, this type stuff. Like, near my God to the Titanic going down moments. And the entire thing had this air of, like, you know, a celebration. So this is this people who had spent every day of their lives on Twitter complaining about how awful it was, how it was la hell site, how it was miserable, how they felt horrible being there. In that moment of like, you know, annihilation, when the promise of being freed from this thing comes onto the horizon, they're able to look back and be like, actually, uh, I loved it. It was the greatest thing of my life. It made everything in my life possible. Uh, I owe my sanity to it. All that stuff. All that stuff that, you know, it's not more true than the stuff about the hell site that they hated it. That was true, too. Like, that's the that's the reality of living under capitalism. That's the thing that turns us all eventually uh, mad is that all of our pleasures are, are lashed into this uh, sadomasochistic framework where the things that keep us going, literally, like the things that uh, allow us to survive mentally in the punishing, alienating, uh, uh, late capitalist doldrums we live in, uh, are the very things that keep us connected to it, keep us welded to it, and things that emerge out of it. You know, that's the dialectical reality. And we can't do anything about it. Oh, God damn it! is the robot voice back? I think that means I'm double I, I forgot to did i not yeah i have the thing muted god damn it so it's like we have to imagine sisyphus happy and sisyphus is fucking happy i'm going to log off and log back on because last time it didn't do this so uh that might work okay i literally turn it off and turn it back on again in the style of boomers which i am I'm Boomer, 
Don't fucking... Uh, okay, Boomer. You call me okay, Boomer. Guess You're just telling me who I am. I, I know I'm a Boomer. Fuck off. But it really shows that, like, there is both this, like, love and addiction to Twitter. Like everything else that we're, that we're lashed to the mast of. Uh, and also this deep loathing. Not even of the thing, but of ourselves for being dependent upon it. Uh, because we could theoretically break free. This is the reality that we can't really talk about. We could, all of us, break free of all of the shackles that we are on as a society. We could cut through the, 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 the black iron prison's gates with the fucking laser of our minds. Now, I'm not, now, I'm not blaming anyone for not doing it. I'll, tell, I'll explain why, even though we could, we don't. But the capacity, I do believe, exists. And the thing that would make it happen is if enough people decided, uh, the rules don't apply to me. I am going to act like this reality is as illegitimate as it actually is, as opposed to, in every moment of my life, uh, adhering to its dictates. Not just in public, but privately. You know, the, the, the Foucaultian uh, self-policeman in your head. And what that policeman is motivated by, the thing that keeps you going, is not really, uh, the one in the home anyway, is, is uh, the one powered by your addictions, by the things that have given you some sort of relationship of, uh, of mission and task and purpose. And you're going to fucking focus on those. Because that is where you're able to approximate something like the human will to power to to uh, connection, too, because remember, like, all of these things run against connecting to other people. They run towards hoarding pleasure to the self. Because pleasure cannot be really shared without a sacrifice. And in a world where all sacrifice seems futile, the logical thing is to hoard pleasure. But if you decide... These pleasures are not my pleasures. These are an alien imposition. Then yes, you will be thrown into immediate jeopardy. You will be thrown out of uh, the degree of comfort that you do have. And I do mean comfort down to the level of a roof over your fucking head. Or a roof of your choosing as opposed to a state-provided roof, if you know what I mean. Or... You know, actual death. Those are all to the to the you know to the embodied being separated from the whole. Those are all worth pursuing. Because what else is there? That's the first thing we have. Because our, I mean, our relationship to our body is already sort of an abstraction. Like the intellectualized self is a fantasy, and it is only sustained through belief. Like our belief in ourselves is as fundamentally religious as our belief in God or science or anything else. And that's a thing that new atheism misses and always did. Because the, the very self that you're trying to use to determine reality through rational faculties is a theological conviction. Because you are in the backwash of this body, you know? Like the mind is only processing stuff the body has already done in response to an environment that it's in. Those instantaneous responses that form our bodily reaction to the world around us, we don't get to think about them. We don't get to decide consciously, using language, using our self, we cannot think them into being. They have to come faster than that. What we think is, okay, what did we just do and why? We make a narrative, a post facto narrative, about what the fuck just happened. That is what consciousness is. Spe so, uh, by the way, this is also why I do believe that God, not just in the sense of, oh man, we're all God, but like a, a universal consciousness moving towards a goal of self-realization. Uh, like that is what a God would be. That is what it is. Like that is our notion of God as an actualized human self. That's what Mormonism imagines God to be. That's what all of the, uh, the monotheistic religions that emerge once you have like a concrete, fixed relationship between uh, one class, a slave class, and one master class. That dialectic is going to power all of human social history, and therefore all of its structures, all of its 
modes of production. So you, we're all seeking something that will sever our connection. And the thought is, the fantasy that people have is, if Twitter goes away, then I will be forced to find uh, meaning to be new tasks, new missions closer to myself, which means closer to other people. And that means, hey, I'm going to, through those actions, build these new connections with other people that change my hedonic calculus, that make me now be like, oh, uh, th my narrow pleasures can't sustain me. Because we don't have easy ones like Twitter. We have things that are harder to come by. We flee to the internet because the, the, the satisfactions of life are harder to come by. Or, even if we can access them, our enjoyment of them declines over time. Geometrically. Just as the rate of profit falls, the rate of pleasure falls over time. In one specific type of pleasure. The rate is de determined differently. The rate is determined by our access. The more access to pleasures we have, the more we will uh, be able to pursue uh, those pleasures and stay ahead of their declining, like, actual felt enjoyment. But once you plateau, just like once an empire reaches its territorial limit, the decline sets in. And, it's, and this is all echoed through every structure of consciousness. The self making, uh, uh, making itself, le the mind making the body legible, because yes, they're the same thing, but the mind is alienated by definition. But that alienation can be managed by a conscious awareness of it that turns into, over time, a deeper uh, uh, reflexive belief in it, which means determining the way you encounter the world and the way your body responds to the things it sees and hears and, and senses. The evidence of its senses. That your body is acting on it without you thinking about it. But if you trust your body, then... There is no break between what you want and what your body wants, and therefore you're going to make the right decision. That's why we're stuck making no decisions, because we can't even connect to our own bodies. Because we're fully our minds now. That's the final... We're, we've pulled ourselves out of our bodies. Capitalism has helped us do that. It's the technology that's pulled our souls out of our body, and now it's just floating. Uh, but it can't... But we're still stuck in bodies. How do we manage that? We have to go back into our bodies. And I think that's what we're all doing. That's why I feel like I'm doing. Like... I feel like in describing myself uh, on these vlogs, I swear to God, I feel like I am managing my own impending death. Because I have been a hypochondriac my entire adult life since my injury as a teenager. And that means that I uh, have basically described my entire life trajectory as one towards annihilation. Because the self is all I've ever really felt. I've always been super alienated from my body to a neurotic degree. And then I had this injury as a teenager that just wrecked my uh, my ability to like sense my own body, like to sense my uh, danger level because I'm in pain all the time. And so I spent years just panicking about the feelings I had and turning them into death. And I still do that. But now, instead of worrying about, oh, is this really happening? Am I really dying? And then trying to reason myself out of thinking I'm dying and then ignoring it through pursuit of things like going on Twitter. But over time, the pleasures of that get less, but the feeling, the pain, the anxiety is still pressed the same amount. So it, this, this thing is my body, put, like, it's my body pushing against myself saying, like, you're going to die soon, relatively soon, in that you are mortal. But if you do, you will not be able to get back in your body in time. You will not be able, you will be lost. You will be severed. You'll go to hell, outer darkness, Gehenna, or just be annihilated like Tony Soprano if you're a, a materialist. One way or another, it is a, it's a fear of metaphysical extinguishment. That is insanity. Because you're not, not, you're, 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 the body is you. It's all one thing. And the death of the body is the freedom of the soul, but only if that death 
is a peaceful one. Or at least, I, I really do think everybody is saved. But the amount of pain you experience, the amount of fear and pain you experience before it happens in your individual life, that's not up to you to decide, uh, except how to respond as it's ending. And if you can address your death, uh, like Heidegger talks about, then you can rob death of its terrors. And the earlier you're able to do that, the more you're able to negotiate your life and the feelings your body has and the feelings of danger and feelings of reward and punishment, feelings of uh, safety and love beyond the self. And you'll be able to realize, oh, my pleasures are only those that can be shared. And what does that mean? What are the implications of that? It changes what you can have fun with, what you can have fun doing, your, doing with your time. Because you're able to think, when I die, I will look back on the life that I have at this moment. Like, imagine that, because we don't know when we are going to die. And that is the fantasy that the, uh, the, the fantasy underlying my hypochondria is that you can know. That is what comes out of the rationalist fantasy that has emerged out of Christianity. That, oh shit, uh, we've, we've run out of road here in terms of a metaphysics. So wh wh what, what, can, what can we do? How do we make sense of this? Uh... And that creates this model of irrationality. If we can, if we can describe the universe, we become God. I think that is the underlying metaphysical logic of, of capitalism, uh, and that is why every capitalist is trying to become literally God. For for a long time, rich people built monuments to themselves, but that was because of the amount of technology that there was uh, allowing and uh, abetting their rule. You know, you, you, fucking pyramids, uh, the, the big graves, and then later uh, public works. Like once the political sphere opens up more and it's not just available of God as interpreted by, you know, your priests. Now that you need a deliberative, deliberative process because you need, you have more technology that you have to wield. Yeah, like you have to, this is why I think Taoism is the one religion that uh, is not terminally poisoned by the logic of class society, which is why you hit a dead end with Christianity and Buddhism that because you're creating uh, a dichotomy, an artificial dichotomy between dying as a sinner and dying as a saint, dying as someone who has been saved or someone who has been damned. Even Hinduism and even Buddhism, the one, the religions that embrace uh, the circle still have an underlying preference, a, 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 a imposed preference for one uh, way, way of being in the, over another in terms of like its ultimate resolution. Like it, the cycle that you are trying to escape, right, has people who are closer and farther away from escaping it. And so you have like a holy class who spend their life basically not experiencing uh, uh, the drag of pleasure, the drag of desire, and therefore achieving extinguishment, which is the reunion with all, which is the same as the death of the body, but it is also uh, the concept that heaven in every uh, less abstracted religion tries to explain, tries to get across, and fails. That is what that's, and and that is different than somebody who's going to die and come back and have to go through more and more pains, more and more misery, unthinkable amounts considering how much misery exists in the human life, and that's that's a thing to avoid, and so you need a class society to allow people to pull up to provide uh, instruction. But what if the end experience, the final experience? of all minds is the body making sense of the actual end of life in that little tail behind extinguishment that is the soul. So that means, sure, you go through a bunch of fucking uh, other lives after your own. 
But the experience of, of final awareness is still a narrative that retrospectively brings everything together and therefore heals all pain. And if all pain is healed, then letting go is possible. That's what we all fear, regardless of religion, is that we won't be able to let go. And why? Because we live alienated from ourselves and each other thanks to the reality, the persistence of class social rule. That is why no religion can encompass this truth. In the moment of the end of capitalism, when class rule, which is terminating here in capitalism, one way or the other, I do believe that, has to be reckoned with. And of course, I might be wrong. Capitalism might persist. There might not be a crisis. But here's the thing. Everybody in human history lives with some notion of apocalypse because you can only make sense of everything retrospectively, which means all of our notions of conscience are built on a, a perception of something that's already happened. And we actually have, we have, uh, by the way, we have recorded in, I believe, the South Pole, evidence of particles moving backward through time. I think people can correct me if I'm wrong on this in the chat, but there has been, I obviously am a layman and this is me pulling things out of my ass, but I'm just talking about what vibes to me, what things vibe, vibrate together and make sense. You can sort out the details when later. You have to act first, and that means also intellectually. You have to act first. And one of the reasons we're all paralyzed intellectually as well as spiritually is because we can't act. But we can only figure out what, ha what to do after acting. The reason there's no left is because it's a bunch of people waiting for an action because they are too strapped to their, uh, um, strapped to their obedience. We are all strapped to our obedience. But if this is true, what does this mean? When you die, you're just dead, right? Everything that the materialists say, it just, it goes black, right? You stop getting signals, it stops telling a story. That is true. But the implications of that, I think, mean, on the reverse of that, that the, that the retrospective reconciliation of the soul is also inevitable. What does that mean? That means God exists in any form, any in form that an individual or a group of individuals can imagine. Not consciously picture. This is the important thing. This doesn't come from thinking about him all the time, thinking about some abstract notion of God. It comes deeper than that. It's the reason that you don't, you don't will your dreams into being. You don't you don't stage that tableau. That tableau is staged for you just as reality, quote unquote, reality is staged for you because it's all staged. It's all a hologram. But the implications of this is, oh, I don't have to worry. And what that means, all means I don't have to worry about anything. I don't have to worry about literally anything, including losing my, uh, my, my adherence to the world. Meaning I can turn against the state in a meaningful way. Meaning I can start saying no in a meaningful way. One of the reasons we don't do it is because there's no organization to put our action toward other than just being antisocial. There's, there's uh, politics, but politics is compromised because it's being done by a bunch of people who have not had that moment, you know? That spiritual pop. The belief. Because it is, an, it is not being given to us. We come to it individually by fluke. Our, our conditioning is to the non-existence of God, regardless of what we think we believe, regardless of, uh, of how much how based our trad Catholicness is, or how deeply uh, uh, grounded our evangelical faith in, in, in God, in, 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 in Luther or fucking, I guess I should say Calvin's God. Because Calvin is the one who's refining this thing into an actual religion of capitalism, as opposed to Luther's earlier creed de corps of the die. Like Luther's conception of Protestant, Luther's Protestant Reformation is the um, cry of the dying feudal order. Like as it's, it's denied, oh, like, oh, this thing is going to die. How can we save it? And Luther is trying to save it. 
Luther fails to save it because it cannot be saved. Calvin then emerges with the birth of capitalism as the refined form that can adhere to capitalism and push humanity towards its extinction. Its extinction. Because remember, the, the, the social order is what's emerging from these, uh, the, the, the collective brain of the social order, the collective will of the social order is what's being expressed by people like Luther and Calvin. These people who are his, the histor history compacted to a point. And then they become the mouthpieces for historical forces beyond their conception. And Luther is the, is the mouthpiece of the, historic, of the conception uh, of a feudal order that is in terminal crisis. And the, the Reformation is this attempt to, uh, to, to it, it recognizes that the Catholic religious tradition is damning us to hell because it is making us into capitalists. Because capitalism, remember, is embedded in feudalism at this point and is emerging. And there are capitalists all through feudalism now. They're living amongst everyone else. But they are living in a way that is dra dramatically alienated in a way that their none of their neighbors are not, and their neighbor, neighbors respond against them. Anti-Semitism emerges from this. It's the uh, autoimmune. Uh, I'm sorry. It's the immune system of the feudal order, because the peasants get exploited by these capitalist systems that even existed in the medieval, like height of feudalism, like like money lending and stuff. It was concentrated around this social other, which of course that was. That was the machine protecting itself. And under stable conditions, it could do that forever. But the conditions weren't stable. The, the, the land got depleted. That's a big part. Even before the Black Death, the land is getting depleted. That's crucial. That's where you, the enclosures come from that. Uh, and then you got, you know, the Little Ice Age. Which just knocks all the fucking uh, pieces off the board. And Luther, you know, the son of of a of a capitalist, like this is how close Luther is to this transition. Okay, Luther's dad was a uh, was a peasant farmer in Germany. Or I'm sorry, Luther's grandfather, Luther. Before they weren't the, before they were the Luthers. They were the Luthers. Uh, so Luther's grandfather, no, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. I'm sorry, father. I'm literally saying father. His dad, I believe Hans Luther, was born a peasant farmer. He did work on, on his own lands and on the lands of the local lords uh, in, in Germany, in, 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 I believe, Saxony or Thuringia, around there, uh, which is where... Those cities are popping up. They're really doing capitalism, and where the tour, the, the screws are starting to get tightened, and where the post uh, Black Death situation, where the the peasants had a lot more uh, leverage, that's getting knocked down by the state. You know, enforcing this new um, uh, this new capital forward formation. Hey, these lands they don't belong to you. They belong to me. Uh, and I can charge you rents that are market rents, and I can enclose common land so that you can't sustain yourself. So there's responses to that. Some people become religious fanatics, set themselves on fire. Some people uh, uh, become uh, uh, drift to the cities uh, and become uh, peasants, or I'm sorry, drift to the cities and become pol uh, uh, either soldiers or maybe try to make their way in the trades if they're young enough, uh, but probably fall to the bottom. Uh, then there are a few industrious money getters like Hans Luther, who take on uh, paid uh, wage making labor in the in the in uh, uh, the agricultural sector, and save up enough, enough money to go to the city and uh, use the new financial instruments. This is the thing he knew about this stuff. A lot of the people. They had no idea this was happening. It was happening above their heads because it's associated with literacy and things like that. Uh, and he comes in to the city and he lays down a sack of uh, uh, gold coins and he is able to lease a uh, silver mine. I believe it was silver. It might have been uh, uh, ore. Uh, but, and he's able to use new techniques to make it more profitable 
and he becomes a fucking city burger. But the whole time, he is, by the way, in huge debt uh, because he never owns any of these mines. So even though he's becoming a like member of the city council in Erfurt, uh, becoming a big shot, like a Rotarian type guy, he's in the fucking hock to everybody because he's got to keep paying off each loan with the last one. He only make he only pays off uh, uh, the operation completely like a couple years before he dies. Like he just he barely has time to enjoy it after uh, giving up the hustle. And then of course their son he's got to rise up in the world. So they pat him on the ass and they send him off to law school. But there's this, the, he has the heart of a peasant. Not because, of, uh, not because of genetics, just because of the milieu he grew up in. Yes, he's in the city, but like first generation. Like these, the, the mores of the people he associates himself with, they're betting himself every second that he's alive, deeper than his conscious knowledge. He is becoming embedded in a social reality. And his dad is... His dad, though, who's more uh, wedded to, he, he's psychologically more wedded to this project. He's more motivated. And that is a thing that comes down to individual, uh, 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 individual biology, obviously, but also experience, nature, nurture. Those things create a ball of person that has certain vir uh, abilities, virtues, ways of seeing the world. And Hans Luther's was for get money getting. Luther's was not. And so he has this revelation when he almost gets hit by lightning to uh, go to, to become a churchman. Uh, that's because he is fleeing from the reality, the implication of becoming a, ca a capitalist subject. That's what Luther is doing there. And he goes to the church, where he thinks he can still adhere to these, sex uh, these, these social... Connections. And what does he see? The church. Oh, my God. The church is a business, too. There's money lenders in the temple. Why is that? Well, he can't he cannot analyze the, the uh, material conditions because he's in them. He's immersed. He cannot recognize those uh, things for what they are. He can only see the cleavages. And the cleavage here is between religion as understood and religion as practiced. Religion of Christianity and its implications for the self and for the value system that they should that a person should hold versus the value system that the society you find yourself in actually holds. And so he's chafing, but because he's a guy whose brain is just built that way, who's who's. His anxiety manifests itself in this hyper literacy, this this logaria. Like he just starts, he starts basically a a a, a paroxysm of writing that can only sustain itself. Why? Because the printing press exists. The reason that guys like me are on Twitter and then going on to podcasts because that's the path of least resistance to our attempt to explain our persistent pinging we're feeling from God somewhere from some knowledge that something greater than us exists. And then we want to make the world adhere to that because that would allow us to die with the least amount of sin, the least amount of sense that we have violated our brotherhood with one another. That's the thing that keeps us from letting go and the pain that we have to inflict on ourselves by dying uh, unreconciled and therefore having to be born again into another body to go through it again and again. you know, Or... Go to hell, like if you're con if you believe enough, just burning in hell, not for eternity, but you know until you're spit out the other end. So it's like purgatory comes after hell, and it's often pointed to by uh, Lutherans as like this horrible innovation, and it was because it allowed them to do the scam with the uh, uh, with indulgences, which allowed the church to just grab a bigger piece of surplus because that's all these machines are. The uh, the machinery of feudalism is just a a extraction mechanism by different elites, military aristocratic, but also religiously aristocratic. The fucking uh, the sword uh, and and the the cross. And it's like we all are forced by capitalism to live as hypocrites, and that gets to us, and it makes us worry. What if I die right now? Will I look around and feel like what I'm surrounded myself with, my life, what I've done with it? Does it adhere to something that doesn't deserve? punishment. 
And of course, we're the one administering punishment because we, we imagine that we are the God who gets to uh, decide, but we're not. All we can do is prolong the process by tormenting ourselves, by uh, fleeing to corporality, to a chance to avoid the final judgment. But the final judgment will be universally, the final judgment is acceptance, because how else would it work? It is a reconciliation to a conclusion. Because narrative is inherently retrospective, which means we either got, however you want to imagine it, it's God as a consciousness in space-time. That's the thing. It has to be in space-time. This is why this is why more rationalist types have problems with Western religion, religious notions of an of a God, because uh, how is it physically embodied? We're violating what we know, which is that there is no separation between space, time, any of these things. There is no out. There is nothing outside. That's the fantasy that we uh, have to believe in to move our bodies around. Because if we really perceived ourselves as connected to everything else, we would not be able to sustain ourselves. We would not be able to captain the ship of humanity. That's what all consciousness is. But it reaches a certain point when the richness of the fantasy becomes so powerful that we are able to assert independent uh, action on Earth. We get to do things other than what our bodies tell us to. Because now we're telling our bodies what's happening. And that is why free will is absolute. Our bodies are being ping-ponged around. And you can look at them as this, oh, you had to do this, had to do this, had to do this. But where that's moving, it's not being determined by random chance. It's being determined by this the, uh, the quantum moment when decisions are made. That's where we all live. We live in that quantum zone. And then what do we know about the quantum world? We know that the laws of physics that we understand don't exist there. Right? We know that. So that means they're not... Uh, that means they... These things are... These notions of... Uh, if we accept that like that is the level of consciousness, that the level of the quantum, the consciousness exists in that gap between your body being ping pong through space... And what your brain tells your body to do, because of its misperception, this is crucial, the misperception of the world around it. And see, this is why I can do this. I can play, play, I can do this show and feel like, hey, you know, I maybe I am dying. Or maybe the world isn't getting worse than I think it is and disaster is more imminent. Or maybe I am one of those guys who's just going to keel over of a fucking heart attack or have a fucking stroke or get cancer. Uh, fast. I don't know. I can't know any of those things. I can't know if my body knows when it's going to end. And I'm trying to talk myself down to euthanasia. The reason I can live in that contradiction, though, is that I, I got to the point where I realized it doesn't matter if that's true, because every explanation gets to the same point. And because of this retrospective nature of consciousness, some embodied creature somewhere gained ability to manipulate at the quantum level. What is that? Whatever it is, I believe, what it is, I believe, is a fixed in space and time technological adherence to reality, to the material reality, the singularity, right, that the capitalists talk about. But they think of it in terms of individual consciousnesses persisting eternally because they're, at the end of the day, uh, fractured, Western subjects whose, con whose understanding of the universe has been fatally dis uh, adhered to a deeper theological truth that renders religions uh, into the tools of power that they become. Because why do you need a state? Why did Luther say we needed a state? To keep people from going to hell. But what if, the, what if there is no eternal damnation, though? What if there's not extinguishment, but there's also no internal damnation? What if there is a unwinding, an unclenching, that has the, the uh, experience of whatever that person's deepest understanding of reunion, of, of, uh, of, of, of completion would be? And I really feel like doing this show and stuff like that, like talking about this stuff, like I'm sitting here in a body, it's doing stuff. 
My brain is perceiving it. I perceive a lot of pain in my body. I always have. I perceive things. And where do I perceive them? I perceive them where I think, logically, rationally, there should be pain. But what do I... Is it logical or rational where I think pain should be? Like, I can read Bob Trump and stuff like, oh, you know, uh, the heart disease, that's the number one killer in America, right? Like, the American way of life, the one I have, kills people with their heart. Now, of course, realistically, that's still actuarially likely to happen to me specifically in a, a, a long enough distance that like I, if they're worrying about it more than just like trying to watch what you eat as opposed to like you know really going crazy uh like finding a mean where it's like you're sustaining health without becoming like uh fixated on it in a way that's like de destabilizing to your uh way of being as opposed to just sitting with anxiety all the time, uh, is to not try to reason your way out of it, but to instead accept the premise. So yeah, that is what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. Because they're both happening simultaneously until the moment when the quantum superposition happens, right? When Schrodinger's box gets opened. But I would say since the sensuous, per sensuous perception, which is how we think of consciousness, uh, is this mirror image of of, uh, of this distorted mirror image of the, the body and the world it's interpreting because of the distance, right? The, the time is the space time difference that creates this gap until the door slams. And when the door slams, when the thing is opened, you have, yes, the extinguishment of a large mammal, the end of life, all the stuff that is horrifying for a materialist to consider it makes people want to do things like figure out how to do a live forever in a computer why these people are frantically trying to go to mars why we can't at the top level where people actually have like enough individual independent access to capital to f like sway the direction it goes why are they all headed towards annihilation because they have to have to try to seek this escape because they are psychotically invested in a distinction that does not exist so that means that as a science guy as a guy who has accepted a certain amount of science at least enough science that i can't uh accept uh like a supernatural intervention at the level that like uh, uh, traditional Christianity had adhered to people, and which was ex killed by the Reformation. Like I said, Luther is trying to save uh, Christianity by trying to save capital, save feudalism from itself by reforming it, because he thought if everybody can read the Bible, they'll behave better, because they won't be afraid of going to hell. But of course, Luther still believes in hell. He has to create a saved and a damned. But... If everyone reads the Bible, yes, yeah, someone's going to hell, but it's none of us, right? And everyone can act that way. The problem is they're not allowed to act that way. They have to adhere to this class society where they're either being exploited or exploiting. They're forced to do things they don't want to do, but are being forced to do, either by direct exploitation or because their comfort depends on it. Their comfort depends on it. And so I'm sitting here saying some stuff that feels true to me. I'm also getting sensations from my body telling me, oh, you are going to die right now. Or not right now, pretty soon. Now, in previous times, what would I be doing with those feelings? And they would spike all the time. I would spend my time kind of anx anxiously and unpleasantly unwinding the logic of it until I distracted myself with something what was uh, had to be like uh, the volume kept having to be turned up. So that's what get me on the hedonic uh, treadmill of doom. But I feel like now what I do when I have those feelings is I'm saying stuff that makes me feel instead those feelings associated not with anxiety and tension, but with relaxation, with so that I can think and breathe 
as opposed to just concentrating on breathing, which gets harder when you're in discomfort or pain. So like if I'm fantasizing about having a heart attack, right? That means, oh my God, when that happens, I'm not going to be able to like think this is, stuff is true because I'm going to be feeling pain. It's scary. But what pain can be defeated, as any pregnant woman can tell you, by breathing. Now, of course, it's still there, but you're not annihilated by it. And that's the thing we fear. That is what hell represents, a pain beyond pain, because it is eternal. But that, as I said, is impossible. Because it's all contained, or consciousness contains the whole thing. So we are both judged and judger. And our final realization is the final realization of that fact. And that means our last act is self, as it could not otherwise be, uh, self-absolution. Because I mean, somebody says you have OCD. I probably have plenty of undiagnosed things. Thing is, because of uh, because I have the, the the spinal injury, I never got to the point where I wanted to adhere my feelings of crumminess to psychological causes, because it never got to that point. At least in my mind, it's like I know why I'm in, I I I know why I hurt. It's because of this thing that happened to me, you know, and I I know why I, uh, I think certain things and I act certain way. So that's why I would have these like anxieties, like, oh, this is going wrong, I'm going to die, and I'd be worrying about it. But then I would be worrying my way away from it, logically. And to me, because I was doing that, I was basically maintaining. And sure, I'm probably, I was ma probably manifesting a lot of awful stuff. I know I was manifesting a lot of awful, self-destructive behaviors that hurt other people too. But... It was a slow enough like decline that I could manage it. And then when the show blew up, it exploded my entire hedonic calculus. It, it's like, oh, you have, there's so much more enjoyment to be had. So many more things that you can distract yourself from. So you can just go wild. But that then got closed again by COVID and a number of other things. And... Now it's a new choke point, and the pressure keeps building up because I'm getting older. I'm getting out of that zone, the youth zone, where the the final thing that puts it off is just the the reassurance of one's uh, statistical unlikelihood of being the subject of such a death. Uh, and so you, that helps you put it off. But eventually that gets harder to do. That keeps going. That clock ticks relentlessly. So you can move with the hedonic thing. But the time thing is just a fact, and it's going to change your hor uh, hormones, it's going to change uh, your uh, distribution of uh, serums and juices through the body, and that is going to change your ability to, to enjoy anything. And so how are you going to keep yourself from destroying yourself one way or the other? By unleashing to opposition with the state to the degree that you should and being annihilated. That's one way. Or totally pursuing hedonic indulgence to try to smash the Lamborghini against the side of the wall, good old neon style. Where you can't keep persisting is that agonized middle, which we feel, as we're hurtling through space and time, we have to do, but we don't. We live in the middle. The middle is all there is. The middle is reality. The choices, the, the, the resolved states, that is our uh, misperception of the universe around us. The, inple the inherent misperception that comes from being embodied by senses that separate. So what I go by is how uh, my heart feels. Like, who do I, how do I feel when I'm around people? When I'm around the people in my life, I feel really good. To the sense that I can sit there and be like, if this is it, like I get an attack and I get a feeling, my heart rate starts racing, because that's the thing. Your heart goes up a little bit when you get that spike of perception, and then how do you respond to that? If you believe it's real, you will freak out, and you will feel more pain, and you will freak out the people around you, and it will you'll try to turn it into reality. 
I've had that happen before. Uh, or, as I said, you can just let it run. Let the clock run. And how can you let the clock run? If you are feeling that that sense of uh, ease that makes you, that comes, I believe, from, well, okay, if this is the time, the reason I don't have to worry about it is because if it happens, so what? However I need to imagine I will be reconciled, I will be. However I imagine I have to be uh, um, uh, uh, forgiven, I will be. Whatever I'm afraid of happening will not happen. Even if it's physical pain. Because again, it's not physical pain. It's the imagined... Uh, a world of nothingness, of nothing but pain, that fills the mind when pain is sharp. But here's the thing about that. That pain is still contained. It's still narratively packaged. If it isn't, it's not pain anymore. And so that's why I can sit here and do this show, and do these things, read my books, in the, in the world we live in, in the hell world, and feel like, okay, what happens? What if this is it? I'm fine. That's the faith. Because it's like, well, whoa, what if it is? What, what if it is? Every what if brings you back to where you were, which is in a, in a chair, hopefully, or lying down, hopefully. You know, not bleeding all over the place. But also, even if then, your brain starts dreaming as you die. Okay, this is another thing that's not made up. Your brain literally starts dreaming as you die. Dreams have an ending, and it is in waking up. Every dream ends. That means the dream of consciousness ends, because otherwise it's not a dream. It's not a dream until you wake up. And is it a good dream or a bad dream? It doesn't really matter, because what you've woken up in is into a greater consciousness a greater understanding that makes sense of what just happened and resolves the contradictions of it and forgives those who need forgiving and collapses down into the, the undifferentiated matter of existence. And this is why I say if there's hope in the future, it is religion, but it is religion of this type, born out of this new struggle. That's why everybody who's going trad who has some sort of like fake bullshit anti-capitalist pose is uh, absolutely full of shit. They are craving an extinct mode of class rule. They're the people who were around when Luther was around and were like, feudalism rocks and we want to protect it, not because it allows us to be good to each other, which is why Luther wanted to save it, but because it allows us to be bad to each other. It allows us the satanic pleasures of life. And that means going back to that, uh, all it is, is is destroying the architecture, rearranging the deck chair, saying capitalism's uh, uh, indulgence needs to be curtailed. And all that means is fewer people need to be considered uh, worthy of life. Like, that's all it is. Like, that's the entire, new, all the brilliant uh, uh, esoteric strands of incredibly br br uh, uh, thoughtful, new right thinking all boil down to this. Uh, it is, there needs to be fewer people who are worthy of life. Life, as I'm saying, is defined as your ability to, to get the good parts out of the machine. The remain, the, the machine that's just pumping up profit, surplus, that is then sat on. Being in that bubble, that is, that has always been uh, the goal, the, the point of civilization is to create those uh, relationships and sustain those relationships. Uh, and so, like, as, as much as you know, the, the heart of Christianity is in Christ's message of redemption. Uh, that is at the bottom. At the top, it's the other thing. It's it's the punishment. It's 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 the saved and the damned. It's it's keeping people uh, above the line of misery. And aristocracy is one way of doing it. But aristocracy is only really capable of dealing with the social realities of feudalism, which is 
uh, some imagined frontier of agricultural peasant labor. As soon as that frontier is reached, you have crisis and accumulate eternally, which is what happens in the, in the, uh, the early modern period. And then what emerges out of that is this new reality. And so we have a new class of uh, rulers. And they don't believe, they didn't believe, they started off not believing in the, the superstitions of the old world. But now we're at the end of history, right? And it's like, okay, we're going to have to, we're going, they're imagining we're going to have to get rid of democracy. Again, because we're, we're, we're thinking this can only get worse, which is everybody keeps doing what I'm doing. That's the fantasy of annihilation that we want to be saved from. Uh, and so the old way, which is democracy, meaning in the West and therefore everywhere eventually, access to, I hate to say it because people get so mad, but treats. Yes, treats. I'm sorry, it's treats. It does boil down to treats. I know that makes me uh, a PMC, Bugman, a uh, World Economic Forum stooge, but it's also fucking true. The democracy imagines self-actualization you imagine that you're protecting is the capitalist one that says we still have an aristocracy, but it is not determined by fixed relationship to land, but fluid relationship to capital, and specifically, culturally, ritually, what we consume with capital, how we publicly consume it, because it has to be publicly consumed, otherwise it stacks up. It has to be destroyed. Surplus must be destroyed. All regimes of class society destroy surplus. They do it ritually until... A crisis of the ec ecology makes them start having it uh, to eat their own, to destroy their own internal structures to adhere, to keep it going and undermine it in turn. That's how all societies end. And then something else erupts from below, but with those same structures. So uh, socialism, Marxism comes out of Christianity, but so does its opposite, uh, hyper-individualism, which is now the governing world ideology of every place. And aristocracy said, the neo-aristocracy, with its new uh, adherence to the traditional Catholic Church, is saying, let's go back to fixed aristocratic uh, access to pleasures, treats that confer our ability to be refined, our ability to have faith. Because the, the dusty rabble can't really have faith because they're too busy rooting around in the dirt trying to survive. Because we are sitting around all day, because we are esthetes, we are able to generate payons to God's love that convince people to believe in God, to save their souls. But they don't need that. Because they're not going to hell. And that is why anybody who is adhering to a uh, any religious tradition that focuses on separating the sheep from the goats, the saved from the unsaved, is reactionary to court. Because given the conditions of the world around us, then the only, the only live political question is not how do we stop this, it is how do we distribute the pain of this. And if, it's, if, you, have, if you have a religion of exclusion and a religion of damnation, then to keep this thing going that allows people to be saved and damned, that, that allows us to ritually affirm who gets to enjoy and who gets to suffer... then they will, they will always uh, do whatever uh, is in their narrowest self-interest, which reinforces capitalism to its extinguishment. Just like at the end of the fucking medieval period, the end of the feudal era, uh, Luther is trying to right the ship, but what does he do? He creates a cleavage that leads to the Thirty Years' War and the midnight 17th century response to uh, uh, the crisis of, cap of feudalism caused by the Little Ice Age. But everybody's so worried about who goes to hell that they fight over that rather than who's in charge, who's making hell on earth to plug our fucking podcast coming up.
And now where we are, we're at, we're at with the end of history. But because the attempt to create a proletarian subject failed, the the the, the attempt to create a a class based point of view consciousness that has is is it sustained by a material reality like people acting to reinforce it. It was birthed into being in the twentieth century, but then it was destroyed. It was extinguished. It does no longer exist. Now we just have these scraps of identity fighting against each other. Who's going to be the ones who are saved? Is it going to be the uh, people who uh, have the aesthetic uh, uh, sensibility and, and refinement to appreciate the exalted beauty of the Byzantine Latin mass? Uh, because, my God, if, it's, if, if we don't uh, maintain a society that allows them to thrive... then what's the point of anything? Or if you'd say, fuck that, but no, actually it's a different demographic group. It's the up, it's the downtrodden. It's not the rich people, it's the poor people who should be in charge, who should get to survive the coming apocalypse. But not all of them as poor people, of course. Narrowly, as, as specific types of poor people, because poor people, class consciousness has not been built. Because... People are poor separately. They're poor alone. They're poor as individualized consumers who are sorted by the media, by the overpowering media created by capitalism, into effective units, demographic units, that then go to war with each other for recesses, resources, just as the Westphalian states went to war with each other in 1914. So that means we're going to get another crack up because we can't fix this from the top. It has to come from the bottom. That means it has to come from outside of our cognitive window. And we have to reconcile ourselves, one, not to dying any moment of the day, but in what conditions? Yeah, sure. For, surround your, surrounded by your friends in a nice house, sure. But what about outside? You know what I mean? Uh, what about in battle? What about sanguinarily in a way that is uh that that it cannot be uh aesthetically wrapped up that's uh that's another question that's that's the question of pain and uh, only love and the faith that love represents can transcend those things now, how are we going to come to that consciousness through experience that's the only way it can happen. So, like, in this thing, this moment that feels like an interregnum while we're, like, waiting for Twitter to die so that we can be freed, because, again, to get back to the beginning of this, if we are freed by Twitter because it goes away, because we can't go on anymore, because that, that road is closed, then we have to put that energy somewhere else. And, I mean, I'd say cynically that for most people, they're going to find another thing that is equivalent to Twitter that has, puts them in the same lock as Twitter, that robs them of their uh, essence to the same degree. Uh, or, but some, degree, some percentage of people are genuinely going to have to refocus themselves. And in so doing, find meaning in connection as opposed to severance. Uh, because we are reinforcing severance every minute that we're on social media. I hate to say it, but because uh, my life depends on it, but it is a fact. That means, like, this thing's going to go away at some point, uh, and we have to reconcile ourselves to it being sudden uh, and to it making us have to reforge understandings of the world that are going to be painful, one way or the other. And that is what I daily strive to do, is to, uh, is to filter my feelings through that lens. And I don't have to do it consciously, this is the beauty part, because I can go... And examine, like, when am I feeling actually, like, you know, below conscious thought. Like, the thing that we're, again, trying to make sense of afterwards. My body, you know, what is it sending to me? And uh, that'll go up and down. But our narrative of it can change. And it can change our relationship to our bodies. Uh And yeah, like one way that I've been able to redirect things is that I read more now and I do more projects. I do more, uh, I, I work more like a, the hell of presidents thing. Like that's a lot more.
Because when I'm doing that, I feel this glide. And that's what it is. It's we're all seeking the glide, which is the way, right, in Taoism. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the search for Taoist alchemy is to search to, so that everything you're doing, you feel like, I want to be doing this and I should be doing this. And your body will tell you that. Your body will tell you that. But that is not, it's not, you know, making remaking the world as you see fit. It is fitting into the world as it is. Uh, but of course, I don't glide all the time because, you know, there's a reckoning. There's a reckoning in my body. There's a reckoning just from all the memories that I hold, that I've experienced, you know, that uh, that is not, goes doesn't go away completely. It can be managed, but it's still a, a signal. It's like a, a tinnitus or a fucking car alarm. It's just a question of turning it up and down. And it's managing that dial because... It's being a stride sensation. It is not feeling them. Feeling them is part of it. But uh, and and one thing that he and what hedonism promises is, oh, I will feel like this all the time. But of course, that is literally the devil's false promise. Um, it is feeling that way even when you feel bad. You know, it is feeling something other than anxiety and something other than tension, even when you feel bad some way physically, or you're in, in uh, a uh, tedious or unpleasant situation and uh yeah it's like it's just it's this process of basically recoding your uh uh deeper reactions to things by being conscious of the way your body is responding that's why breathing is so central to basically every religious uh practice regardless of what its name is I realize I have not even come close to talking about the book, and this is uh, annoying. I'm sorry, but I feel like some of this was pretty useful. I, I honestly think I'm going to have Chris chop out the parts of this uh, that are about uh, Luther and stuff and maybe put it on YouTube. I think it would be a good uh, amendment, and a good like intro to the first episode because we talk all about Martin Luther in the first app, so I've been thinking about him a lot. But yeah, he was trying to bash feudalism uh, back into shape. Because if everybody read the book, including rulers, merchants, they would be like, oh, money doesn't matter as much. Pleasures don't matter as much. I should act for my fellow man. And feudalism could respond to the fact that, oh, uh, the X amount of land can no longer sustain Y amount of people. Like, because we're extinct, we're, we're draining it of resource, we're draining it of nutrients. Uh, it's, it's losing its, its productivity. But our population is exploding. How do we manage that? And as long as you needed a, an economy to be, hey, peasants, you work. We just sit here on top of it. And what do we do with our time? We fight each other over bigger portions of land so that we can then have little sports that are simulations of our wars, like hunting and, and jousting and shit, and then eating all the surplus. As I said, publicly consuming all of the surplus. That, that's, that's our society. Well, what if there's less surplus? Oh, we're going to have to get more from the peasants. Squeeze them out. Uh, and the church is part of that. And the fucking indulgences is how to get more fucking surplus. Because you cannot, because there's nothing in feudalism that, uh, that forces anyone to improve their uh, production of, uh, of agriculture. Uh, improve uh, the soil, basically, over time. Because if they're going to just get a fixed percentage taken... From their uh, leader, no matter or from their uh, liege lord, uh, no matter what, and they're going to be fixed on the land, then and working on a land on farming, farming is tedious and 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 unpleasant. You're going to work as little as possible. This is always going to be the case. Uh, so you're like, fuck you. I'm not doing anything. And uh, or I mean, I'm not going to work any more than I have to. And you can't make them because. Power is not concentrated to uh, actually coerce. But once you introduce a uh, fixed, or I'm sorry, a, uh, a market in rent that says, oh yeah, the, the, the connection from, to the soil, that's gone. You know that connection to the soil that's part and parcel of your religious understanding and that makes all of it make sense? 
the thing that like the grass root of it, the, the beating heart of it that actually does me like, oh yeah, my life is difficult, but it also provides me with these uh, reconciliations, these solaces of God's existence, you know, that I can find uh, help for my, uh, uh, that's all gone. Everything that allows you to live in this world is gone. Good luck. What are you going to do? And yeah, you either become despairing, you become a rebel, or you move to the town. Or you suffer under the yoke. But the more you suffer, the less you're going to get out of the land. And what happens in England is, is there's this free market in, in, uh, in leases that means if you can't hustle, you will lose the land. And that means somebody else will get it. And who's that going to be? The person who is more motivated. The person for whom, who is able to look at what's happening and figure something out. The more, not you might say intelligent, but it's it's as much luck as skill. And and you have to take the uh, you have to take the judgment out of it because we're talking about individual uh, uh, accesses of like perception. And we're saying these are better than those because they help us do this, but they don't do it by themselves. That is what's that's the that's why we're headed towards apocalypse because we're trying to deify one type of consciousness as superior to all others and then like make it eternal. But that value system is based around one facet of a basically infinitely faceted diamond of human consciousness. But it's not just intelligence as we would understand it, it's much more than that. It's uh, color. It's it's attitude. It's how agitated are you? It's how much does being in a body freak you out and make you want to do something? That differs from person to person. Sensitivity, but not sensitivity to everything. Sensitivity to certain things. And again, shaped by behavior or, or shaped by uh, your encounters in life and traumas. To use that word. Oh God. And that's going to drive some people to do what Hans Luther did and go to the city and make his way in the world. And then those people are going to be the only people in the world uh, capable of acting in, acting with a full a, a effect because they can act in concert. Because everybody in the city has the goal of making more money. All the other elites have completely conflicting goals. Yeah, they want more money, but how they're going to get it is winning the game, though. Winning the Game of Thrones. But meanwhile, the Game of Thrones is becoming less and less important because who gets what is being determined in these towns. Not in the courts of the kings, and of the, in the margraves, in the landgraves, or of the fucking uh, uh, cardinal nephews, and the pope. That means a new religion, a religion of people who are in that condition. And how do you how do you create it? L Luther doesn't create it; he's left in uh, the bin. Calvin creates it by making a totally individualized, rational religion that says your perception as an individual is the sum total of reality. Your rational response to that is the sum total of God's uh, realm, of God's conception of the world, is only through your individual perceptive keyhole. This is absurd. This is about as deep a blasphemy as you can commit. But it, it, it erupts from sitting in a room reading the Bible all day instead of making religion an actual communal endeavor. And what are you going to do more of? Are you going to do more feast days and processions as somebody in the city? Or are you going to do more business? Where you have to treat people as strangers, not as brothers in Christ. Okay. Okay. I'm debating whether I should just go long today or postpone this because I've already done an hour. I feel like I got across some salient things. Yeah, what do we what do we think, folks? What do we think? All right. Well, I probably won't go too long. And honestly, there's not much to say. So the second half of the book is pretty anticlimactic. Uh, because the first half is like, okay, here's the Chinese state built up post uh, from the fucking, uh, the, the Qing to, uh, to, to Xi Jinping. Or, uh, yeah, it's like, what is this state, what is this state capable of? Is it capable of 
Does it represent a challenge to global U.S.-based capitalism? Can it represent an alternative to it? And uh, the answer is uh, no, not at all. Are you fucking crazy? What is wrong with you? Why would you even think that? Uh, I have to say the tone of the second half is very much duh. Uh, because he starts from the premise, from the, uh, from the world systems Wallenstein Arigi premise, that socialism, wherever it emerged as a, as a mode of production uh, in the 20th century, was not a separate system from capitalism, but a subsistent, uh, but a, um, a, a, a system within the greater machine of capitalism. And I think that is 100% correct, by the way. You want to come at that? You can. I don't agree. To me, that seems uh, beyond debate at this point. I understand why people want to believe that these states existed as like genuine, different, different, uh, operated anyway, as like a gen And the thing is, culturally, they did operate as an alternative. But again, at the deeper level, they are component pieces, which means over time, their economies are shaped by the reality of competing against other capitalist states. The USSR was broken by its contradictions that had accumulated by that point. But the fresher, younger CCP, which is built on a nationalist struggle, as opposed to the Russian Revolution, which was specifically anti-nationalist in character, and remember, nationalism is what comes bubbling up first for modernity. Way before you get to socialism, it's nationalism. So that nationalism was, bo was born under the conditions of capitalism in, in, with Russian characteristics emerging in the Soviet Union. So that means that when the crisis comes, it fucking splinters. It shatters like a fucking uh, sheet, uh, like a fucking crystal candelabra getting shot down by a, by a ranchero. But in China, where there is this unifying national struggle that undergirds the state ideology, there is sufficient uh, uh, legitimacy to impose a, uh, well, legitimacy and, here's the important part, capacity to really adapt. And, and it's not just uh, that they have this nationalist myth to fall back on. It's that because of that, the uh, state, the Chinese state, the Communist Party state, has uh, done things with that legitimacy. Some of those things were bad and disastrous, but also kind of necessary, because you've got to shake the dew off the peasant lily to make modernity. This is an undeniable fact. And honestly, people should be more more acceptable, accepting of the Wallenstein Rigi thing, because it really does take the Soviets and the Chinese off the hook a little bit. Like, the... They thought socialism in one country was possible. They were wrong, but they thought it, and they acted like it. And the thing is, they were building capitalism without knowing it, or at least building an inevitable road to a crisis that would create either capitalism or, or an annihilation. And Russia basically got a little bit of both. China, though, because it shook the dew off the peasant lily, uh, but then, with the Cultural Revolution, sort of pivoted and, and, and cleansed itself of its guilt for that. Like, if you look at the Great Terror. You can look at the Great Terror in a number of ways. One way that I think is useful to look at the Great Terror is the Great Terror was the not so much, it was, yes, uh, Stalin's individual paranoia. That is true, but only to an extent. His paranoia was being buoyed forward and, and, and uh, allowed to long rampant by a general desire, an incohate desire within the Bolshevik Party to punish itself for what it had done. They all thought it was necessary. They all thought that the, the that that starving all those peasants was necessary for the greater project, and they th and they felt felt that the results prove that. Look, look at the industrial capacity we're building. Look at what we're doing. We're creating a viable alternative to the to the West here with our bare hands every day. Yes, people are dying, blah blah blah, but we're doing it, and we're doing it. They're doing it right in front of our face, though. And they're, we're doing it to people who we consider comrades. The, 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 the British did the same thing, but they did it to people who they didn't consider people. So they never sweated it for a minute. They had already pre-washed their minds of any guilt associated with that. So there's no political purges. There's no political violence at the heart of the British Empire. And we get to call it free because of that. Because of the untroubled consciousness of its bourgeois and ruling class. Oh, congratulations. You are actual reptiles.
That's why they're the most reptilian country now. In Russia, though, because this they had taken power, they thought they were going to get a world revolution. They didn't. But they've taken power, and they're holding the reins of history now. What are they going to do with it? They want to bring about the socialist utopia. They really do, because it validates everything else about them. The way the idea of heaven validated everything that the medieval lords did. And they're closer to the truth here, because we've gotten to the root. We've gotten to class. We've gotten to the creation of a real consciousness capable of being the Godhead, of actually being God. But what that means is when you kill all the peasants to make modernity, you did it. The market didn't do it. God didn't do it by making them brown. You did it. That guilt had to go somewhere. And sure, Stalin made people paranoid, but they wanted someone, they wanted someone to pay for it, to pay for what they had done, because they felt bad about it, even though they felt like it had to happen. So if that's the case, it had to happen, but it was wrong, then if someone needs to pay, by definition, it's not me. I was the one who made it good. I was the one who contributed to the good part of it. All the bad part, I can imagine being somebody else's fault. And I can point to them, and even if I know there's no Trotskyite records, even if I know that there's that's all made up, I can still feel better about myself. There has to be this like coming to reckoning with the reality of making uh, modernity. And a, and, a, and a socialist polity does it publicly, ritually, and that's what makes it illiberal and horrible, according to Martin fucking Amos. But it's also this, the evidence of its collective morality. The lack of that violence in the centers of the West is proof of its amorality. The proof that it's made by monsters. The U.S., God bless it, it showed it had a heart because it had a civil war, you know? But then after the Civil War was determined, okay, we will now more concentrate the pain of modernity. Before it was going to get all over the place. We're going to concentrate it more on black slaves and fucking white Irish. And we're going to let the fact that we're doing it to one scare the other ones and enrage the other ones into a, mil a political alliance with capital that will cut its own throat. And now we're headed towards another ritual of violence because we can't contain the contradictions and we can't give out the, the treats. we got to find someone to blame. And so the, so the cultural revolution is that in China. It's, it's 30 million fucking people died in like two years from 58 to 61, two or three years. That The, the, the old thing you see in like a... Like an old movie or a uh, like black and white sitcom, they're trying to get the kid to eat, and they'll say they're starving people in China. Before people said Africa, they said China, and that's because of the Great Leap Forward. Uh, so he said the Soviets were dealt an impossible hand. I'm saying that. See why? This is what I don't understand. I'm literally saying they were dealt an impossible hand. If they wanted to stay in power, they had to do that. Why did they have to stay in power? Because they had convinced themselves that they were the center of socialism, and they weren't. Socialism is everywhere. Socialism needs to press everywhere. Yes, it needs a material base, but one that builds the charnel house of capitalism cannot be that one. Again, how are they going to reason any differently? People on the periphery, freaks might, like Trotsky didn't, but he was too much of a fucking... His problem was is that he couldn't uh, believe in anything. He, he couldn't make any sort of faithful choice. And that paralyzed him. And that's where we all find ourselves, which is why everybody's spiritually Trotskyite, even if they hate Trotskyites. And why do they hate them? Because they're looking in the mirror. Because you're queasy with what has to be done. The Georgian thug wasn't queasy about anything, because he was the Georgian thug. But the party was not Georgian thugs. The party was ver people in the middle of, this, of, 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 of their humanity, people the, the middle of everybody, people with hearts. And they needed to make sense of it. It's like they need to make sense of killing 30 million peasants in the 50s. And so then there's a cycle of, of a purge of that guilt. And then the generation that is purged of that, but in building that state with the death in the, the 50s, Mao creates the structures that capitalism in China will emerge from. The state-owned enterprises and also the healthy rural population that will then work in those state-owned enterprises 
that Deng is able to operate after the Cultural Revolution. Which means that when the bill comes due in the, in the 80s, really in the 70s, but in the Soviet Union it was put off a little bit uh, by the fact they were an oil exporting nation. But by the 80s, it's, it's, it's hit hard in both places. And they respond in different ways because you have the anti-nationalists uh, who, by after the Civil War, uh, or I'm sorry, after World War II, ended up having to reformulate a new nationalism, the great, great patriotic war nationalism, in order to make sense of that because you couldn't use socialism anymore. It had been belief in it had been extinguished by the conflict, by the blood, by the monstrosity. China built these state-owned enterprises, and because it's, it did not have the centrifugal force to pull away from it, which is what happened with the Soviets, all of their peripheral parts that helped feed blood to the heart were, being, were pulling away. There was none of that in China. What they did instead is, this is in the fourth chapter, uh, the, the, the central state starts sending, out, starts sending out these state-owned enterprises in the regions. And then local bureaucratic elite Take them over, and and they get incredibly uh, sweet deals on sweet on uh, loans from the state bank. They're just giving everybody loans, and they uh, use those loans uh, to build these big unprofitable state-owned enterprises. But that further belief in the state, because now the state is actually responsible for giving people things like jobs in these new industries. People are rising up by right? connecting to the and, and greater uh, accelerating capitalism in this in in China, but of course it also creates. What we talked about last week, it creates a vast amount of uh, inequality within China, and this. Uh, so the fourth chapter is pretty interesting. So fourth chapter is uh, it takes the question of did China really was is China really the reason that we uh, that there has been any progress on uh, global inequality. That's because people want to say, people who love capitalism like to point out, oh, global uh, poverty has dropped in the 20th century. Uh, and the response to that is that's pretty much all in China. Uh, and so this, this chapter says, oh, so how much did China actually contribute to world um, um, inequality? And he points out that there's two forces at work, and that's the thing. All of these questions have within them these dialectical relationships. Uh, and in, so with China, you have the fact that, uh, so China it de gets more per capita income, like people have more uh, in income relative to the global mean in China. So that means that global inequality goes down. But within China, there is places that get more funding and more um, development and places that get less. And the rural places get less the the this is this is a slow motion version of uh, what happened in the 30s in Russia, uh, but now in these uh, autonomous state owned enterprises that make profit and are getting foreign direct investment, but they're unequally distributed. So you have this inequality within China that is increasing. Uh, And once China gets to a point where it's above a uh, the global middle for economy, once it becomes an above average wealthy nation, all of a sudden any further inequality change in China makes the global inequality greater. Uh, and also, like China, in some respects, empowers um, developing nations by being able to sort of negotiate on their behalf in things like the WTO and the IMF. Like, for example, uh, there was talk in the Bush years of getting developing countries to finally scrap their agricultural subsidies, which is something that uh, the Washington consensus demands. But China has held up any agreement along those lines by insisting that, uh, that uh, core countries like Europe and the United States, they have to get rid of their agricultural subsidies first and also. And that just scraps it because that's not happening. Those are two powerful constituencies. Uh, 
So he goes through the evidence, says in some ways, uh, so that's one way that it helps them, but also, you know, it contributes to the tribute economy of the American empire. And it, it contributes through its uh, purchase of U.S. bonds by American military hegemony that you know, enforces uh, like raw export models that undermine local uh, the, the robustness of like local industrial economies and therefore makes them you know less uh, uh, powerful in negotiating with developed countries. So it's it's a push and pull. On the on the whole, he comes down on saying uh, it probably broadly has China has been. Uh, has reduced global inequality, but while helping contribute to the system that is, you know, perpetuating uh, inequality everywhere, and therefore in some respects and in some other places, distributing that pain, basically, because it, you can't have just uh, uh, development. It's coming somewhere at someone's expense, at some uh, area, some uh, part of our ecological and uh, biological matrix is, is paying for it. And the more it pays somewhere, the more unstable the relationship there to the center becomes. And then you get full uh, destabilization. So uh, the, set, the fifth chapter is about uh, whether or not China represents a uh, real difference, a different uh, political economy than the uh, uh, Western Amer American capitalism that it, you know, trades with. And he basically says, no, uh, the United States and China have a totally symbiotic relationship. Uh, the U.S. Uh, pumps up uh, credit and uh, borrows money uh, in order to pump up credit to, you know, buy our arms and maintain our military uh, supremacy, uh, allow our reserve currency or our currency to be the world reserve currency. Uh, uh, impose the actual like sinews of the world supply chain empire, uh, and in return, China uh, suppresses consumption uh, in their country. Uh, uh, they 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 take the debt, uh, they make the stuff or assemble the stuff, uh, and they keep consumption at the household level low, because in this dynamic, it, one part of it is over-consuming, the other part must under-consume. So that's the relationship that China and the United States have. And the reason that's able to persist is because of the differing political systems. Uh, the United States, yes, like they broke, they, they suppress wages too. Like the United States government has been suppressing wages for as long as the Chinese have. Uh, but the difference is, is that they have extended credit to allow for consumption to balloon. China does not do that. They keep the wages low, but there is no uh, concomitant uh, easy credit. So consumption stays low. And it, on the other side, U.S. consumption is up. That ebb and flow, that's, that's not, that, is, that cannot change uh, if we don't change uh, structurally. And uh, one of the big reasons that he uh, insists that there will not be some Chinese century that like dominates the globe and changes global capitalism is the only way that the U.S., that the Chinese uh, economy can persist in the long run without uh, coming down from like a significant internal crisis, just like the U.S. is, uh, is if it recalibrates this relationship. Because if it's unstable in one direction for too long, like with any capitalist system, any extractive system, the second law of thermodynamics kicks in, and you are getting less out of more effort. And... The only way to change that is to reintroduce movement in the system. And that means Chinese consuming more, and this is crucial, Americans consuming less. Like I said, America, our political system means we can agree together to keep wages low, but since we've defined uh, self-expression by uh, consumption, we're going to have to offer them an, uh, the possibility of consuming. And so whoever is in charge, the other top side that wants more power, for their own membership, can just say, we'll give you more consumption, and then they'll vote for you. So there, there's this pressure to keep things in a relationship, even if it totally industrializes in, uh, uh, the American economy and tears the heart out of the Midwest. It's the only way to stay in power. In China, because they kept the party state, that uh, there's nowhere for that desire to go. No, no constituency hat is there to say, hey, we're the alternative who will let you consume. So they keep it down. Uh, and those things aren't changing. And if those things don't change, then the crisis will happen because they cannot reform internally. 
that is, I think, the, the key insight into this crisis stuff is that they cannot uh, internally change because the people who stand it up, structure it to keep their elite status uh, perpetual. And once they do that, it means that in the future, when conditions change and they need to change with them, they can't do it. They can't see the necessity. They see it through a ideological uh, buffer that just makes them double down on what they're doing. So yeah, that's his big, uh, that's kind of the, the big chapter in terms of his argument, is saying the U.S. and the uh, Chinese economies are totally interdependent at the level where uh, neither side can independently reorient their economies. Uh, the, the Chinese, and, and here's the real thing that really harbingers poorly, is that let's say the Chinese were able to... Uh, we're, let's say America was able to come to a point where we're actually voluntarily consuming less, where our political system allows us to consume less. Now, this is, I think, what like the fascists imagine they're going to do. I think that the America first, like the real intellectual MAGA dumbasses, the, the, the dummies, the smartest dummies, uh, think they can do is they'll seize control of the government. And then by instituting all those awesome values they love, the epic American masculinity values they love, uh, the, the, the hierarchy that they worship, people will voluntarily consume less because now they have purpose. But what they have failed to uh, notice is that the very things that they're trying to reify are consumer choices. It is, you are giving me the freedom to express my identity, but it is not my identity as a member of the German Volk. It is a member at the end of history, at the end of the the, the, the Pringleification process that peasants are pushed, in, pushed through over time. That becomes the marks of a consumer cycle. So you, you will only enshrine a consumer fascism that will destroy itself. It's going to have to go to war to try to push out boundaries because that's the only way that any class society... And a, a consumer-based society where consumption is identity and consumption is freedom is by definition class-based. Because you're fighting over surplus extracted not through a collective endeavor, but through individual immiseration. So the Chinese own a ton of our stock, or of our uh, treasury bills. Because it's a it's it's the closest thing to ready money. It's the closest thing to fully convertible and and, and guaranteed American dollars, which is the safest uh, investment. Why? Because of the military. So that's why we get to work our things out erotically instead of having it imposed. Like instead of something having coming into our like neurotic political arguments and saying knock that shit off, we get to have these breakdowns in public because we have the guns. So one way or another, we're going to keep consuming. Our model will be consumption until we, the, the nukes drop. So that means that they cannot even move the lever in China. But say they could. Say they could. Say something happened in America that led them, led Americans to consume less uh, voluntarily. Or maybe not voluntarily. Maybe they're just way fewer Americans. I don't know. Uh, but not so many that, you know, a, a crucial block is knocked out of the global order. Because if that happens, then... You're back to localized power, just like after the Roman Empire. You can't really talk about global capitalism anymore. You can't talk about global anything anymore. Um, and we're talking about, can China like avoid this and transcend this? That's, that's what the open question is. Uh, but that would mean they have to consume more. And my God, what does China consuming more look like? What is, look how America consuming more looks like. What is China consuming? Consider something that uh, Huang points out in this book. Uh, one, of the marks, one of the marks of increased um, prosperity and the rising of a middle class in China is, sure, automobile per, uh, uh, purchasing, but also meat consumption. Meat used to be the reserve of the aristocrats. In Europe, for example... The diet of a peasant uh, was almost entirely grains, some like uh, fruits and vegetables from foraging and stuff, but mostly like a starch. Uh, and meat was for rare occasions and, and uh, harvest festivals and stuff. 
Uh, whereas the diet of uh, aristocrats was basically exclusively meat. It was almost entirely meat. This is the public ritual of surplus destruction and consumption that we're talking about that reifies power. So what does that mean? What does China eating more meat mean? My God. Like, yes, there are technological fixes theoretically to a lot of these issues, but they're not happening fast enough. It is, it's clear that we're past the point where we need to collectively put the brakes on, but we can't. Everybody has, because we have a brick put on the, uh, uh, the accelerator, everybody has a brick on the accelerator, including China. Yeah, like Matt, Matt Iglesias' book is basically this, but he says, hit the, hit, the, hit the thing even harder. But of course, what's dumb about him is he doesn't understand. It's already at the, at the fucking ground. Guys like Iglesias, these fucking, uh, these courtiers, their entire thing is seeing what's happening and explaining afterwards why it's good and it's okay, it's fine. It's fine, actually. Don't worry about it. That is the message always. Don't worry about it. That is the eternal message of the, the Iglesias of the world. Don't worry about it. Hey, what about this uh, fraudulent crypto guy trying to buy the entire Democratic Party? Don't worry about it. He's an effective altruist. His parents were consequentialist moral philosophers. So it's like, hey, look at this dynamic that's going to eat the world, uh, Matt. Oh, we just need more Americans because of our can-do spirit and ingenuity. We'll solve all these big problems. Now, more likely, it'll crack up. But what does that look like? That's the big question. And I think this book helps me further believe that it will be as it always is. It will be a breakdown. Power will not go away, though. The apocalypse that we imagine will not be there. There will just be zones of exclusion. Like I said, the apocalypse already exists. It's a, it's a, a mile from my house, the apocalypse exists. It's called Skid Row, California. Skid Row, Los Angeles. That is, that's it. You want to know what the apocalypse is? There it is. You can go look at it. You can walk there. You can go and help people there. Or you, you can gawk at them. That's there. It's a little display item for the apocalypse. And it'll just be a process of, 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 of capital retreating to readouts of power. Everywhere. And the guy like Iglesias thinks, I'm going to always be in the center, so it'll be okay, as long as I can explain why it's okay. So he, at the end, is the same as the fascists, is the same as the esthetes who say, uh, fuck democracy, let's do turbo techno-feudalism, and I want to be de deciding who, who... I get to watch through the, the CCV camera as they're doing the drone strikes at the border, and I get to call it an epic. Iglesias is wanting the same thing. He's just going to be... He's going to think all that stuff's horrible. But my God, if you could just see the green shoots here on the, uh, the Terminator uh, uh, Grand Execution Council. You know, the, the Blood Council is coming up with some amazing new uh, fixes for uh, the tyrannical uh, regime of occupational licensing in American middle city, uh, inner cities. So all of their job is to tell you all as well, because the people they talk to, you know, if they all did say no, it would be a problem. And there are people who are excited by that idea and there are people who are terrified by it. And I really got to make people like confront, if you're really scared of the thing breaking down, like, are you scared of being immiserated or are you scared of uh, having to watch more immiseration? And if the answer is to watch more immiseration, that means that you have the power to not do that, you know? It just means changing your relationship to uh, what feels good. And it really is, it is, like now we have a politics that's entirely libidinal, but it's entirely based on selfish individual pleasure. No, short term, give me something to give me dopamine to get me through the day, which is outrage, which is self-righteousness, which is fantasies of domination. And then there's the hard work of politics that you make that that has a lot of tedium around it, but also has moments of real connection and meaning. And that cumulatively is what defines uh, politics. And that is what we all have to redefine if we're going to approach what's coming for any of us and what we have to deal with every day, with uh, a sense of presence and purpose. Okay. So uh, the last chapter is about the coming crisis 
and how is China going to be able to change it? And I kind of already went over that because that's the chapter where he says the only way that uh, China is able to even stave off a significant and state legitimacy imperiling crisis is if it does this rebalancing towards uh, consumer um, consumption, which is why he says they have to liberalize politically because that will provide pressure to make people uh, be able to consume more. But of course, you know, that's just deepening the trench. That's just accelerating everything. Like that is, that is the accelerationist Nick Landian thing is, yeah, this is good. Crashing into an abridged abutment in a Lamborghini is the best way to go. And I simply say the underlying premise there is, again, of the terror of repose, the terror of, of stillness because of the presence of guilt. But if guilt can be made transparent by awareness of the love that is expressed first to the self through forgiveness and then outward to all, And that's happening, and it will continue to happen. And everybody will be saved, even if they fall through the cracks. That's what I believe. There's no decision that's wrong uh, in the full fullness, but here's the thing. The reality of that, and this is what Luther thought, that compels you towards... Uh, uh, that compels you towards the right thing to do, because without consequences, then what is the thing to do? The thing to do... What makes you feel best is to feel love. That is the thing that feels best. All other feelings that we might enjoy are just attempts to, uh, um, to make up for and patch up a lack of love, but it doesn't work. You, that's why you need more and more. That's why you, you dig your own grave. So, like, this feels like a moment of suspension. But those moments are where you are, you have the, if you have the possibility, and not everyone does, because like I said, I'm in one relationship to reality because I don't have to do a lot of unpleasant things if I don't want to. Like, physically unpleasant, like demanding. I don't have a boss. So it's like, that's why I am still motivated by this fear of falling from this thing I've become addicted to. But I also don't move frantically to try to shore it up. I don't move to a compound. Because I don't want to do anything that is motivated by a false reification of uh, consequences that don't exist. And that is, that's the Aubrey McClendon, Nick Land thing, is good old Neon. Like, if, if I cannot imagine... Uh, reunion, I will make it happen through action. I will I will negate all of those paralyzing questions by creating the one undeniable act we can ever do, which is to end it on our own terms. And then by ending it on our own terms, we we are reconciled, like fucking uh, moths hit in flame. But in the process, what are we doing? What are we leaving in our wake by doing that? And that's that's, that question is what chases us to that point. That question uh, is what drives the pedal to the metal. But if, it's, if there's no one really chasing you, then there's no reason to, to, to annihilate yourself. So yeah, I, I sit here, I do my work, <laughs> such as it is, which is very pleasurable to me, intellectually stimulating, and I get to be with people that I, I uh, love and I get to do things that make me feel like I'm making other people's lives better in the personal sense. Like, you know, uh, reaching my hand out when I can. And there's that churn that's like, what else? What if this is it? But, you know, I think the key is just being able to reconcile yourself to where you are in every given moment of your life. And the thing is, you will lose track all the time. 
holding on to it is impossible. The way is not the way. But every moment has the potential to be a moment of reflection, where whatever amount of string you've pulled in, you'll be able to drop. And that that is the wiping of the slight. And that is like confession was hor was 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 uh, reviled by the Lutherans because like it's another scam service of the church that you don't need. But the cycle of being able to repent is meaningful, a cycle of repentance, because we're always moving through space and time and, and encountering it and, and losing our bearings. But coming back is easy if we know that forgiveness exists. So I got off the track a lot, but that's the, that's the review of the book. And I would be open to reading something else that's more uh, bullish on China as alternative, but it would have to be very focused on Xi's regime in specific particular, because the general trend uh, that he sketches of the Chinese uh, political economy up until Xi, because it kind of, it's kind of a little dated at this point, especially considering all the stuff that's happened in the relatively recent past, you know, the acceleration. He talks about Belt and Road being initiated and, you know, it's really accelerated in the years since he wrote it. So uh, I'd be interested in seeing that. I'm not going to read the governance of China. No, thank you. Uh but I, I can't escape the belief that China is fully imbricated in a uh, global machine. Like it, it, it still has no uh, underlying logic uh, outside of development through the channels that are at it, the control of the specific constellation of elites that make it up. And that's what they're doing. Now, there is this, like, refreshing and renewal coming from below, and you're seeing, you know, some executions of, of, of uh, financiers and stuff. But since China cannot quit the U.S. dollar, and this is a key thing, without cutting their own throats, they cannot build an alternative to the global U.S. capitalist system. What is, what is the response to this? If anyone has one, I'd be interested in it. In order for China to call the shots in a meaningful way, right? Let's take this as a syllogism. They would have to be the world reserve currency, right? They would have to have the world reserve currency. They would have to have control, effective control of the world reserve currency. But in order to do that, they would have to get rid of the capital controls in their money market. And if they do that, that is the death warrant of the uh, Communist Party of China as an independent uh, power repository. So, okay, you've done it. You're now in charge. You just, you can only persist in the model that the U.S. has created. You can only deepen it, as the U.S. did to the, the system that, uh, that the British created. So... If anyone has an answer to that, or a book that, or an article. Honestly, an article would be nice. I read a whole, I, but yeah, uh, something that just takes into account Xi's attempt to reassert party control and how it's going to deal with just that fundamental contradiction at the financial level. But again, people are like, they don't like when you say that because they need someone to come in and save the world. They need somebody to keep this global system going. And what I keep saying, what I keep trying to emphasize is that whether it collapses or not, the future is not within its walls. The future is going to be built by the people who are being sharpened by necessity. But nece and, and what necessity means when you are bereft of the technological uh, uh, matrix that we have all embedded ourselves in is each other. It's all we got, man. In order to have the Chinese take over, they would have to be able to coordinate all of these global capitalist economies from a center and coordinate their actions through policies that would redistribute dramatically resources from the West 
and north to the south. There is no constellation of power outside of China that would accede to that without just going to the uh, final, res uh, uh, <clears throat> without sweeping over the negotiating table and going to war. What leverage could China have to enforce any kind of changes to the political economy outside of themselves that redistribute in that direction? What we're talking about is how do you make voluntary reduction of consumption in the West? That is the challenge. And if anyone has any work that L argues that uh, Chairman Xi is up to the challenge of peacefully, because if, if, if they resist, then the game's over, right? We get, that, that resolves in a nuclear war. That's over. Uh, short of that, you, you're talking about a, to one degree or another, peaceful. Sure, there will be social ferment in specific countries, but there will not be an apocalyptic confrontation. Peaceful transition, more or less, of uh, consumption uh, from the West to the periphery. Not as consumption, this is the key thing, but as uh, development, as, as resource development. Or I'm sorry, as, uh, as uh, industrial development. Not just producing stuff for the market, but producing stuff to uh, essentially re-terraform the planet, basically reducing consumption everywhere and redirecting resources to, yeah, re-terraforming the planet. Now that is a, that's a thing that could happen. And I feel like the fucking LaRouches, as and much of crackpots that they are, they at least recognize that. Like, even though they're trapped in the same nationalist miasma as every other American political current, <coughs> and that makes them blows them off course, uh, their essential recognition that you would need some sort of global infrastructure project, a globalized Bolt Road, to uh, manage the coming crisis is correct. So the reason they look like crankpots is because that's impossible. But that's not because they're crazy. It's not because they're crazy to think that's what a thing we should do. They're crazy to think it's a thing we could do. But that honestly makes everybody who's still invested in uh, politics at like the national level also even more delusional because if the literal land bridge and global belt and road is is impossible what the fuck are you doing caring about who becomes president so it's like you have to reckon with the larushis because they have they see the outlines of any viable future for the human civilization as we understand it and want to keep it. And you got to reckon with that and say, well, what now? And to me, the thing that allows me to live with that reality is the knowledge that the, the, the fucking green shoots will be appearing elsewhere. And also that the LaRouche project is doomed because the fact that that is the initial reaction of everyone who has not been deeply indoctrinated into a specific esoteric internet-based heuristic of the universe tells you everything you need to know. Because the distance from reality is clear to see if you are not motivated otherwise. But that's true of other things through different lenses. Like I said, the, the Iglesiae are just as delusional as the LaRouches. But because their delusion is more widely shared and generated in the media and necessary and generative of the media, it gets to be called normal. But it's just as fucking wacky, man. Okay, if the Chinese, uh, if the Chinese do uh, do cold fusion, then all bets are off, obviously. Like that. But the thing is, that's that is the black swan that everyone is sort of depending on, and Elon Musk represents it in human form. Elon Musk's entire scam was predicated on, on, on 
absorbing the necessary social belief in this uh, rationalized Messiah. Like the Messiah as technology rather than as, you know, a human spiritual awakening, which is the end result of the dead machine that we worship ripping itself free of humanity and becoming all powerful. And Musk is like its human carapace. And now it's cracking because the, the, the fantasy is losing its ability to be sustained at every level. The, the scales are falling. Uh, but in what direction and how will people respond? We're terrified. And that's and that and that little visual in, in on Twitter was a representation of that. We're we're terrified and we uh, want to be uh, delivered. And the 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 the, the Musk worshippers, the dead enders, are the ones who say no. Like he's the God has not failed. We can still do this. But the people who don't believe in him are despairing. Are are even more despairing because there's they haven't replaced it with anything. There's just this hope that something will emerge. And that's kind of why I think Twitter isn't going anywhere, because that's such a powerful, load-bearing structure of the attention economy that more than delivering any specific discrete message, which is what people get too focused on when they talk about Twitter as a, a propaganda machine, it's the structure itself that is propagandistic. But it is, it's a vacuum that I don't think uh, can last. It has to be filled because we are too distant from one another to put that newly uh, unleashed energy to better use. Not individually, not, we're all not doomed to that. As a group, we will tend to, the center of us, find another thing to do because the center of us is hollow because the center of us has been hollowed out. And it's not our fault and we will not be punished for it. We will not be eternally doomed for it. We will learn. We will all learn every lesson we needed to. Okay. I feel like we got somewhere with this one. I feel like this was very productive. Uh... I hope it wasn't too robot sounding. All right, feeling good in the neighborhood. All right, I will switch mics for the next one just to see if that helps. All right, talk to everybody later. I'm going to go make some soup.